Ever feel helpless to change who you are? You might want to stay tuned because that's exactly what we're going to talk about on today's episode of Authentic. Today I was trying to think of the most evil person I could think of without resorting to Hitler because, well, that's just too easy. Everybody does that. In fact, if it's possible, and I'm speaking as part of a family that was profoundly affected by what the Nazis did to Europe, but if it is possible, I think we've begun to overuse the Nazis to the point where we almost trivialize what they did. For example, I hear people on both sides of the aisle throwing around the word fascist to describe their political opponents. And when you talk to these people, it becomes obvious they don't actually know what a fascist is. They just know it's a negative word, so they apply it to their ideological enemies. And of course, if you've spent any time cruising the world of social media, you'll know that Hitler's name gets thrown around an awful lot because people who appear to lack the ability to express their point of view in a meaningful way seem to resort to the Nazi label to sum things up. Honestly, it's, it's just lazy, and it's a shame, because what happened under the Nazis in the first half of the 20th century should never be downplayed. If you start calling people fascists or Nazis because you don't like them, it begins to rob those words of real meaning, which in time will water down what actually happened, and I'm not convinced we want to do that. People are doing it now so often that someone's actually given this phenomenon a name, and it's Godwin's Law. Godwin's Law says the longer an argument goes, the more likely somebody will bring up the Nazis. And it happens when people get frustrated because they've run out of intelligent arguments. It's just too easy. But the other example I'm going to resort to to describe evil incarnate I'll admit, it's not a whole lot better. I'm going to go with Jeffrey Dahmer, the famous cannibal and serial killer. But then again, maybe arguing from an extreme example will help me make my case. A few seasons ago, we looked at that book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that famous 19th century novel where Robert Louis Stevenson explores a bit of a psychotic break in a character who's trying to actually eliminate the evil in his heart. Dr. Jekyll hates the fact that he has a tendency toward evil, and he resorts to the world of science to help him overcome it. Let me read you just a little bit. He says, It was on the moral side and in my own person that I learned to recognize the thorough and primitive duality of man. In other words, the fact that we seem to be both good and evil at the same time. I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both. If each, I told myself, could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable." Now, this might be a work of fiction intended to amuse people, but the themes in this book are some of the most important themes in the history of human thought. When, when you and I first come into this world, we're born into a relatively comfortable environment unless you happen to be born into an abusive household. For most people, however, childhood is a pretty good gig. Your needs are met, your world is protected. But eventually, we do go out into the rest of the world and discover that all is not well. There are bad people and bad things out there, and we're going to have to contend with those things on a daily basis for the rest of our lives. And then we learn to blame others for our difficulties and it seems like human suffering has just got to be somebody else's fault. It's something I've witnessed in young political activists quite a bit, and I used to be one of those. Their desire to fix the world almost always seems to demand a scapegoat. The government, corporations, or, well, frankly, anybody who isn't part of their little group. Now, that doesn't mean that the world doesn't have evil people who create a lot of our problems, because there are. But at the same time, we seem to have this massive blind spot when it comes to identifying our own contributions to pain and suffering. Eventually, most of us come to a moment when we begin to realize it's not just everybody else, that we are a substantial part of the problem. Because you 
are just as self-centered and self-interested as everybody else. We finally realize that the evil that plagues the human race also has some anchors in our own hearts. So what Stevenson does with his character is have him turn to science to try and fix the problem. But what happens is that his experiments lead to a split personality, where the good Dr. Jekyll splits off from the evil Mr. Hyde, and Mr. Hyde, much to his chagrin, begins to wreak havoc in the community. So now we have an evil man who is completely unhampered by any morality. Now, anybody who reads the story honestly is going to realize that this is not a tale about somebody else. It's describing you. There is something about all of us that is profoundly broken, and we seem powerless to fix whatever that is. I find the same theme in some Greek tragedies, where you have a hero trying to accomplish something important, but that hero is stymied by his or her own flaws. A really good example, well known, would be Sophocles' famous and horrible story, Oedipus Rex. A play about a Greek king who has to live in the shadow of a horrible prophecy. One that said he would eventually kill his own father and then marry his own mother. And of course, he doesn't want to do that because who in the world would? It's wrong. And yet, as the story progresses, he discovers that he can't fight the prophecy, and he accidentally kills a stranger who turns out to be his father, and then he marries a woman he later finds out is his birth mother. It's, it's a horrible story, but the Greeks were illustrating a really important point. There's something wrong with us and we can't fix it. No matter how hard we try, we're always going to find ourselves powerless to eradicate the evil that lurks in our hearts. And that is probably the worst realization that most of us come to. to. To finally understand that given the right circumstances, we are just as capable of incredible evil as an Adolf Hitler or a Jeffrey Dahmer. I know it's a little bit shocking. None of us likes to think that. But all of us have a really dark place in our hearts that can suddenly emerge if we choose to feed it. And of course, with Jeffrey Dahmer, the word feed might be inappropriate. But of course, this all brings me to the claims of the Bible, which underlines the idea that human beings really do have a terrible flaw, that all of us are the real cause of suffering. Modern critics, especially those who walk in the footsteps of Sigmund Freud, like to suggest that the Bible's teachings are harmful. They'll cause neuroses by putting limits on how you express your natural urges. But that's a really shallow understanding of what the Bible says about your human nature. I mean, right at the beginning of the story, as the first two people are being ushered out of paradise, we discover that the real problem is the dual nature of the human heart. After all, what was the essence of Adam and Eve's transgression? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was a problem because in the original formula, we were made to be perfect reflections of the goodness of God. We were made in His image. But then we suddenly became something far less than that. All through Genesis 1, you have God calling His creation good. In fact, He calls it good every single day. And when it's completely finished, after He creates the human race, He calls it very good. So in other words, we weren't always like this, not in the beginning. And that propensity toward evil didn't exist until we chose it. And now it's killing us. The fruit of the tree wasn't actually toxic. It was our willful choice to indulge evil, to declare independence from God that caused the problems we now live with. And now I have another problem that we have to live with because the clock on the wall says it's time for a break. So don't go away. I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. In his excellent commentary on the book of Genesis, a commentary that I've only just started reading, Rabbi David Sykes has a very interesting observation about the nature of the Garden of Eden and the tree. Just, just listen to this. What exactly was the tree of knowledge of good and evil? 
Rabbi Moses ben Naaman explains that before man ate from that tree, he knew only goodness, and so he acted accordingly. Not being aware of evil, man was not tempted to go against God's will. It was only through an outside being, namely the serpent, that evil gained a foothold within man. After eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, man was capable of both good and evil, and these two drives gave rise to an internal struggle. From good, there was now the descent to good and evil, and man's task of maintaining good in the world became more challenging. From the Bible's perspective, this is our number one problem. We have a tragic flaw, a propensity toward evil that we can't fix. Wipe out all the world's dictators, take away the power that some people use to make the rest of us miserable, and the problem will still be there. Why? Because it's endemic. It's human. It's not just some people who pose a problem. It's all of us. So consider someone like Karl Marx from that perspective. And let's think about some of the ideological changes he introduced in the late 19th century. What Marx proposed is that the structure of classes we have in society is our biggest problem. And he taught that in time, progress would lead to a revolution. And then everybody would just start sharing resources equally. We would all share the means of production. But now look what happened when those revolutions actually began to break out. The most notable one being the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, when angry Russians suddenly got rid of the ruling class and seized the reins of power. Marx would argue that violent revolutions are undesirable but necessary for progress. It would just be a temporary problem. But then look at what actually happened after the Soviets came to power. They introduced a new ruling class, one that exercised a lot more brutality than any monarch ever did. The so-called equality people hoped for quickly devolved into another two-tiered system. You had the party elite who lived in the halls of power and then everybody else who ended up living like paupers. It was exactly the same problem they had before the revolution, but now it was amplified. But why? Why did that happen? It's because no matter how good our intentions, there's a deep well of evil and selfishness lurking in every human heart. And even a basic book on world history quickly reveals that we have never, ever been able to change this. All we ever do is substitute one horrible idea for another one, and the suffering never stops. And just in case someone wants to accuse me of playing ideological favorites, you can see the same thing right here in the United States. Every four years, we elect a new president who promises that this election is going to dramatically improve our lives. Every two years, we elect a somewhat new Congress, and every six years, we reformulate the Senate. It's been going on now for nearly a quarter of a millennium, and while some governments have proven better than others, not one of them has ever solved our biggest problems. Why? Because unless we figure out how to change our essential human nature, that is never going to happen. That's kind of the point you find in the Old Testament book of Daniel, which shows us a progression of human governments that only get worse with the passage of time. In Daniel chapter 7, the prophet sees a series of animals coming up out of the sea, each of which represents a different major empire. There's a Babylonian lion, a Persian bear, a Greek leopard, and then a ferocious Roman beast. Now, at the time he had the vision, the prophet Daniel was living in captivity, something that God allowed to happen because the nation of Judah had started living like their Gentile neighbors anyway. Originally, the descendants of Abraham were supposed to be different from all other systems of government. They were something of a republic with a supreme written law that was anchored in the temple and its services. But then they demanded a human king like the Gentiles had, and God allowed it. And from that moment forward, the Hebrew kings became more and more and more corrupt until God just blew the whistle and told the his kids, time to get out of the pool. They had done the same thing as Adam and Eve. They told God, no, thank you, sir. We're going to do things our way. Of course, that meant there was no point to maintaining the social structure that God had established, a situation where every individual essentially answered to God directly. Now that they had demanded a Gentile form of government, there was no reason for them to have their own republic. And I'm using the word republic quite deliberately because that was the word that 17th century English dissenters used as they debated the idea that God didn't intend for monarchies. And those debates 
were part of how the American Constitution was conceived. Once God's people in Daniel's day became indistinguishable from the other nations, God just gave them what they wanted. And from that moment forward, they had to live under the thumb of pagan oppressors just like everybody else, and their special protection was gone. Then in Daniel chapter 7, we discover that the only thing that will ever fix the mess we live in is a new kind of government, one introduced by the divine intervention of the Creator. Here's what it actually says in Daniel 7, verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Turns out, the Bible raises the same questions the pagan philosophers did. What is the nature of evil and suffering, and why do we have to live with it? Why can't we seem to fix what's wrong with us? There's a passage in the book of Romans that I've read on this show many times, but I'll read it one more time, because it's an amazing description of the internal struggle that you and I have to live with. It was written by Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, a man you would think would feel some kind of sense of accomplishment for all he did, maybe even a sense of moral perfection, but instead he struggled with the evil that lurked in his heart. He writes, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Now, that might seem familiar to you. Most of us understand if we haven't been desensitized, right? If we haven't ruined our moral compass by abusing it, that we should be a lot better than we actually are. To varying degrees, we recognize the difference between good and evil. And once we see that, and we understand our role in it, we begin to resent the evil that we produce. But our attempts to fix it, our attempts to correct the darkness never work. And so Paul writes this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Okay, we're going to have to take another quick break because it's not just the evil in my heart that can't be controlled, it's also the clock on the wall. And the violation of timelines on TV or radio also cannot be fixed. So let me do the right thing, and I'll come right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. A little while ago, I was reading a 19th century author who suggested that one of the very worst moments that life has to offer is when you see your own negative traits coming out of your child. It turns out it's not just you and me who are morally compromised, but our kids are too. And it's frustrating because if we can't control ourselves, how are we supposed to correct it when it shows up in our kids? The longer you live, the more you realize that you are a part of the problem. It is not just everybody else. Which brings us to the Bible's explanation of sin and repentance. Just before the break, we left Paul mourning over the sinful thoughts and deeds he couldn't seem to stop, and he suddenly wails, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And here's the solution he comes up with. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What he's suggesting is that the solution to my wickedness is the same solution that Daniel witnessed for the world's wickedness, and it's Christ. Where you and I fail to exhibit the image of God, where you and I fall short of the glory of God, the spotless Son of God offers to stand in your place. Paul refers to Christ as a last Adam, and that's because Jesus was a replacement for the first Adam, the man who blew it. So. God in human flesh is now a perfect human being, and because of that, He's earned the right to stand at the head of the human race. And at that point, to use the language of the Bible, He offers to adopt us. 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, Paul writes, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. To the church of Ephesus, Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved." Now, I, I have no idea if it's still on the air because I actually don't have cable, but you might remember a program on ABC called Extreme Makeover Home Edition with Ty Pennington. The premise was that they were going to make tweaks to existing homes in order to make them more livable, you know, minor modifications. But then a surprising number of times they seemed to just bulldoze the house and then rebuild it. So one day I'm watching this and it occurs to me that that's the way the Bible describes the problem with humanity. You and I typically expend a lot of effort trying to paint over our serious moral flaws, even throwing a second coat on it if it, if it doesn't seem to go away but it never fixes it. That's because our moral flaws run far too deep to be solved by a coat of paint. Evil is not just an aesthetic problem, it's a structural problem. If the foundation of a house continues to shift, patching the cracks in the wall is going to become a never-ending job. What we really need is a brand new structure, a new foundation, which is what the Bible teaches. From the biblical perspective, sin is not just a list of do's and don'ts, it's a much deeper problem. Sin is not just what you do, it's actually who you are. So let's say you have a robotic arm in a factory that starts to malfunction. It's drilling holes in the wrong places in some product because its ability to do accurate math has been compromised somehow. So as a programmer, it occurs to you that this robot has all the tools it needs to fix itself. You're just going to tell it to adjust. Move the hole that typically drills in some product three millimeters to the left and that should solve the problem. But it doesn't because the real problem is that the whole program is wrong. The robot had bad instructions that compromised its capacity and it has no idea what three millimeters even looks like. Unless you fix the core problem, it's going to continue to make the same mistakes. Now, what's interesting is how the word that's usually translated as sin in the New Testament literally means missing the mark. You might be trying to live a good and moral life, but you're never going to score a bullseye as long as the fundamental problem continues to be there. That's what the Bible means when it says that you and I fall short of the glory of God. We might be trying, but we're never going to hit the mark unless something radical, something fundamental changes. And now I've got to take one last break so that I don't miss the mark. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Just as in the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel was written during the Babylonian captivity. And at one point, this is what God says to His wayward people. Listen to this. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. What we really need, according to the words of the Bible, is a change of heart. But before that could happen, we have to admit that our tragic flaw is real and that it's deadly, it's killing us. We've become experts at blaming God for the state of this world while ignoring our own contribution to it. And until we can admit that we are the actual problem, the situation is never going to change. 
the biggest thing that stands in the way of that happening is pride. Because admitting you're broken can be difficult, especially if we've been pushing the evil in our own hearts down behind some kind of moral blind spot so that we don't have to look at them anymore. And it's a very real struggle because, well, God has given us the gift of freedom. We are free moral agents who actually have been given the power to choose. It's the way that a God of love has designed this place. This is why Paul continued to struggle with his own evil, and we're talking the apostle. He struggles with it after his conversion. And this is the reason you often see church people point their finger at everybody else instead of dealing with their own problems. I mean, just try to imagine a church where everybody accepts the notion, the idea, I'm the problem here, not everybody else. Now, sadly, that doesn't happen very often. It's rare because, well, church people also have pride, and sometimes, unfortunately, more than other people. And pride is the original problem, the original sin that gave birth to all the other problems. Maybe the strongest illustration the Bible has for our need to surrender and our hesitation to do it is a guy by the name of Naaman the Syrian. He, he was a military commander who found himself infected with leprosy, which of course is a completely incurable disease, or was at the time. When the prophet of God informs this man that the cure for his leprosy is to bathe in the Jordan River seven times, he was completely insulted. The Jordan was this muddy little creek, and a man of his stature should be bathing in a much nicer place. But you know, there was nothing magical about that Jordan River water. The whole thing was just a challenge to his pride. He had to humble himself in order to be cured of his deep-seated problem. So maybe you're one of those people who has come to realize that it's not just everybody else. It's not just other people. You've been contributing to the mess in this world because you also have very serious character flaws. The longer you live, the more obvious that becomes. Our pride tends to convince us that we should assert our flaws and treasure them. Just live them out. Follow your instincts. Just relabel those instincts as something positive. But what you might need to do is swallow your pride and take an honest look at this book. Maybe, just maybe, the real answer can be found here, with a God who had no problem humbling himself if it meant he could save you. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thanks for watching. This has been another episode of Authentic. You want to help more people see Authentic for free? Like, comment, and subscribe, and share this episode. That tells the algorithm you really like the show, which in turn recommends Authentic to a lot more people. Thanks for your support.